today's lecturer is fantastic. You are in for a very special, wait for it, Halloween treat. Before I introduce our illustrious speaker, I ask that you take one moment, just a simple moment, to check your cell phones and make sure that they are on full silent, no vibrating, no fun, spooky ringtones, so that we can all enjoy the lecture together. Thank you. Where to begin? David Billings, let's start from the very beginning. David is descended from Frederick Billings, the patriarch of a distinguished American Vermont family. Frederick Billings was a successful lawyer and businessman, becoming one of the first and most prominent attorneys in San Francisco during the gold rush era of the mid 1800s. And he was president of the Northern Pacific Railroad. Frederick Billings was active in politics, education and philanthropy, conservation and animal husbandry among other pursuits. That sounds like our Chin Long Emperor behind the scenes. I'll tell you more in a moment. Once described in a local Denver newspaper as a collector's collector for his varied interests and penchant for the unusual, David L. Billings spent much of the last five decades honing his astute eye, collecting diverse categories such as English furniture, Asian fine art, and British royal memorabilia. David's lifelong interest in collecting started quite by accident. As a means to get around the prohibition at his first boarding school, where resident students were not allowed more than 35 cents per week or five cents per day for the purchase of candy bars. I think that's very, very apropos on this Halloween day. David discovered that, the mem that membership in the coin club allowed him to stuff blue Whitman coin books with coins, any coins which could then be used in commerce for candy. His colorful, colorful background and that early interest in coin collecting blossomed into an active American and then English coin collection which continues today with a comprehensive collection of Kushan Empire, that's 50 BC to 400 AD, bronze and gold coins. His late mother-in-law, Mrs. Victor H. King of New Canaan, Connecticut, is credited with advancing David's collecting interests when she introduced him to this new field of Chinese art with a single piece. I will not tell you the rest of the story. I will let our very own David Billings do so. And again, today we have the pleasure of welcoming to the Nantucket Whaling Museum, David Billings, the Chin Long Emperor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to dis dispense with the formality. I won't require everyone to kowtow to me, which, of course, would be absolutely required. I am indeed dressed uh, as uh, the Qin Long Emperor, one of the great emperors in the uh, Qing Dynasty, in his regalia. This is a formal uh, court robe, as opposed to the informal ones that you may have seen. Uh, I'm also wearing a winter hat and uh, carrying in my hands and around my neck a mandarin chain, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, I wanted first to tell you a little bit about my background. As long as I can remember, I have collected. Uh, there's a lot of articles written about collecting, and there's all kinds of psychology about why people collect and this. And I cannot confess to any of that. Uh, I read something recently about it had to do with abandonment issues or something. Well, I was not abandoned. Um, so I collect because I love the objects. Um, to me, knowing about uh, where something comes from, why it's used, how it's used, why it was made, 
that is the great joy. And I've been fortunate to be able to collect a number of the things that I really, really enjoy. Um, uh, I have, since my childhood, collected coins, rocks. I went away to camp one summer and returned. And when my brother-in-law, Sam Dolmy, my late brother-in-law, went and picked up my trunk at a, a company called Railway Express, it doesn't exist anymore, he uh, went to the station and picked up my the steamer trunk, which every child took to camp, and he couldn't lift it. Sam was a very big man, and he was aghast when he got this home. And I had given away all of my clothes uh, for the summer and uh, had brought back home to New Jersey uh, about uh, 130 or 40 odd uh, rocks that weighed several hundred pounds. He was not impressed. Uh, collecting has not always been a family, uh, is not a family tradition. I don't come from a, a family that is collected. Um, I do have a deep interest in history. And to me, the history is what brings alive the objects. Uh, standing here under, uh, if someone was uneducated, you're standing under this enormous collection of fish bones if you didn't know something about it. Of course, it's not a fish at all. It's a mammal. It's a whale. It spawned a whole industry in the uh, uh, Northeast, um, you know, whaling fishing, and of course worldwide. It may have been very, it may have been chased by this boat, uh, uh, or certainly its ancestors probably were. So the history, the research into the objects are what really makes the context of everything come together. Without that. No matter how pretty anything is, whether it's the Hope Diamond, this magnificent uh, uh, whale, um, uh, they're just objects without the context. Uh, and all of the research, are, in my view, are sort of like threads that woven together give you the total picture of what something is. It's the research that got me interested in all of the areas that I've been involved in, Chinese most particularly. I've been very lucky to have uh, 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 other collectors, dealers, curators at museums have always been very helpful. Most collectors are very enthusiastic about sharing their knowledge or expertise. Um, and it has nothing to do with Chinese. I've found that to be true in almost any, any collecting venue. Um, as a collector, and in my collection, which I'm going to show you a couple of pieces of today, I am really not the owner. Before you think that I went and stole all these objects, what I mean by that is I consider that I am just the caretaker of these objects until the next generation, the next institution, the next individual, for them to. And I consider this to be a, a responsible and a serious obligation to maintain them, to display them, to try and find out more information so that I can turn them, whoever gets them next, uh, on to the next, and I hope that they will continue that, that effort. So if you will get settled here, fasten your seatbelts. Today we're going to review from what I call from Zhao to Mao. We're going to go through 5,000 years of uh, some Chinese art, and, uh, and I hope you will enjoy it. We're going to look at about 20 objects. Um, and. Uh, this is how the entire collection began. About 40 years ago, my mother-in-law gave me these two objects that are on the screen now. They are not significant. Oops, she's not listening to that. Um, <laughs> these are Qing Dynasty. The Qing Dynasty was the last dynasty. It ended in 1911 with the abdication of Puyi, the last emperor of China. Um, and these were just incense burners, they were wall incense burners. They're, as I say, they're not terribly significant, but they're very important to me. And I still have these in my uh, museum out in Madikin. Uh, she gave me these two objects plus a book. Uh, these objects have now morphed into about an 800 object collection. We're going to look at uh, 20 odd pieces. This book has given birth to a library of 11,000 volumes on Asian, which includes China, primarily Chinese, but Tibetan, uh, even Indonesian, um, Indian, Japanese, all of the um, Southeast Asian countries. So that's how it all began. Um, the first piece I'd like to discuss um, is this one here, which you may 
first looking at it, think that this is uh, southwestern America. Now, this is a tomb. It's about eight, 18 inches tall. This is a tomb vessel. That means it was found in a tomb, and it held grain for the afterlife. This is from the Neolithic period. This is about 3,500 years B.C. So what you're looking at here is about 5,500 years old. It is the oldest object in my collection. And when Bill Trampash was out at my house and, uh, when he first saw this, I asked him if I could say that it was the oldest man-made object on uh, Nantucket. And he said that he felt that that was an accurate statement. <laughs> Maybe someone has something older. But uh, this is the first, uh, the oldest object, Neolithic period in China. This is before the dynasties began, way before the dynasties. This is 3,500 years uh, before the dynasties began. Uh, it is made of uh, terracotta and it held grain. Uh, the next object uh, or objects are six bronze chariot bells. This is from the Shang period, again, prior to the dynasties. These uh, were uh, hung or were adorned a chariot. Uh, these are, and if you look at these very closely, um, you can see they have a very distinct, which you probably can't see particularly well, but they have a very distinct hash mark on them, the uh, design. And uh, there are a total of eight of these uh, little uh, chariot bells, and they hung off the horses. Um, uh, uh, reins and things uh, on the chariot. There are, as I said, a total of eight of these. Uh, six of them you see here, and if you wish to see the other two, they're in the Shanghai Museum in China. This is a little close for you. But this is from the Shang period. Um, uh, now this is from the Zhao period, again, pre-dynastic. Pre this is about a thousand to 250 uh, before the Common Era. This is a Ding. This is a bronze vessel. Lar well, it's not terribly large, about uh, 10 and a half inches uh, tall. Uh, but this, uh, consider the fact this was made 3,000 years ago. They were casting these beautiful bronze objects. And these were put in a tomb. These were not you know, dinnerware. These weren't in a, in a palace. These were, um, these were in a tomb. Now this one is very special because it has a pictogram on the inside of it. And this was given to a governor, we believe a governor, an imperial governor of a province. Um, and uh, it is from the Li family and it says something to, or it may say, that's always the way these descriptions are, um, um, are, uh, are described, it may say something to the effect of wishing you 10,000 years in the afterlife. These objects were so expensive so costly to have made, far more costly than gold. Uh, the whole process of bronze, thinking of, think of a furnace that would be hot enough. It didn't, it didn't have electric motors back then to fuel fires and stuff. So these objects were so, it took so much time, so much effort, that the emperor decreed shortly after the end of the Zhao period, uh, the first emperor of China, Xi Shi Wan Di decreed that no longer could bronze objects be put in tombs. So we will see the end of these bronze objects in the um, Zhou period. We then move into the Han Dynasty. Um, and this is a, uh, a very unusual object. It is a combination of a dragon, tiger, and a rhinoceros. It is a, a ritual object, excuse me, a mythological object. Um, this would also have been in a tomb. And, and incidentally, I talk so much about these tombs, and I'm not, I really don't have a passion for grave robbing, but had these objects not been put in tombs and preserved that way, we would not know about what went on in China back then. There wasn't a lot of record keeping. The Chinese have I hope I'm not going to be, uh, nobody's upset by saying The Chinese have no tradition of collecting, none. Uh, so what we know about China uh, a long time ago is largely from objects that have come down through the centuries, largely from tombs, particularly in the early part. They believe strongly, they still do in the afterlife. So tomb objects, uh, you'll see this repeatedly in a number of the pieces. 
The Han Dynasty is the first of the major dynasties. It followed the reign, 14-year reign, of Shi Shiwan Di. You may know Shi Shiwan Di, perhaps not his name. Well, you do know his name. Shi Shiwan Di is the reason China is called China. He was the emperor who united China from all of the provinces. It was never united until Shi Shiwan Di. His reign lasted for 14 years. The terracotta warriors, which you're probably all familiar with, those guard his tomb. They know where his tomb is, but they have not excavated. They haven't even excavated uh, the ter all the terracotta warriors and all of the other pits around there that hold them, many, many other objects. Uh, but there is an indication of what the, uh, the, uh, the importance of the afterlife was. Now, this was the emperor. This was by far the largest tomb. Uh, but it's an extraordinary uh, uh, thing. That, uh, that dynasty, if you call it, only lasted 14 years. When he died, his son took over. He was uh, quickly assassinated within a year or two. And then began the Han Dynasty, the first great dynasty um, of China. It lasted 400 years. It spanned the birth of Christ 200 years before him till 200 years after him. This is a lovely and very unusual piece. You can see another one like this at the MFA or the Metropolitan Museum. These two objects are also from the Han Dynasty. And when you were buried, you wanted to have your favorite horse with you. So that's why you have so many of these horse objects. You wanted to have warriors to protect you in the afterlife. Well, you certainly wanted to have your girlfriend with you. These fill that. Now, the one on the, the one over here, is, uh, is, is uh, a normal uh, Han or from the large part of China. The one on the other side, the one with the uh, flowers and the hair, is from the exact same period. But if you look stylistically, you'll see that the one on the right, if that is, anyway, the one on the right um, is uh, quite uh, angular, very staid, very strict. Incidentally, the holes where her hands are, the hands were always made of carved wood. And of course, those deteriorate. These are 2,000 years old. That's why you never see the hands on these objects. Um, but the one on the other side is from, same, from the uh, Han Dynasty, but is from the Sichuan region. Sichuan you may be familiar with because of the food that we have from Sichuan, which is generally quite spicy. But Sichuan, the region, is, is, is a surrounded, large region, but is surrounded by mountains and really uh, developed somewhat separately from the main part of China. And all of the Sichuan figures, or many of the Sichuan figures, I'm going to stop saying all, many of the Sichuan figures, they have this wonderful motion to them. I mean, flowers in the hair. You don't see that in the formality of the regular Chinese. Uh, this one, is she's a dancing maiden. Incidentally, these are, and I apologize for not giving you more information on the size, these are about uh, 20, 22 inches tall. So these are about the same size. Made at the same time, but they're totally distinct in their appearance. And you can tell a Sichuan figure from across the room because it has this fluidity to it, whereas the Han, uh, the normal Chinese figures are much more staid. Now, after the Han period, China disintegrated into a multitude of, of, of various dynasties. This period is referred to as the Sixth Dynasty period. One of those dynasties was a very short-lived dynasty, went for uh, 27 years, and it was in the, uh, the, the Qi province. And this is a northern Qi figure. This is an exceptional figure due to the detail, but also this cape. We don't know anything about what they wore back then, except from this is a wealth of information you get from these objects, because these were contemporary. This is the style of the day in the Qi dynasty. These were, incidentally, almost all these objects didn't come from working class uh, tombs. These are all very important. Size mattered in China. So a small tomb figure was for a less important but very wealthy person. A large tomb figure was from a far more important. The emperor, of course, we all know the, the terracotta wars, they're all life-size. That's the most important. 
But this is a magnificent figure, the detail, but this cape is one of the few, uh, very few times you ever see a cape in this, and the coloring is quite spectacular. This is an attendant. Now this is the position that you all should have assumed when I walked in. <laughs> Again, in the afterlife, uh, you wanted to have your favorite horse, your girlfriend, you wanted to have a stove, you wanted a granary, you wanted to have uh, all of the things to, to speed you through or to, to, uh, to uh, keep you going in the afterlife. Uh, you certainly wanted to bring along your servants. That's what these two are. They're quite unusual, but these are very accurately displayed. Um, these are from the Tang Dynasty period. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, the reason why their heads are bowed, two reasons for this. One, in kowtowing, you have to hit your head on the marble floors, not once, not twice, but three times. And you are never allowed to look at an imperial member. So these are probably from an imperial tomb um, because the face is straight down. And we have another uh, supplicant or a, a, a figure in a supplicant position, and his face is turned sideways. That is in a tomb for probably a very wealthy individual, but not an imperial uh, figure, not, not an imperial tomb. But these are, uh, some people are sort of surprised, but that's, this is where the word kowtow actually comes from. Now, also in the Tang Dynasty, as I said, you wanted food, girlfriends, this, that, and the other thing. You wanted, uh, I mean, many, they had acrobats in tombs, musicians. They had everything you can imagine in these tombs. These were lavish tombs. Not unusual, five or six rooms. And when I mean a room, I'm talking about a room would be this size. Uh, but these are the ones on a little direction. impaired here. The ones over here, these are dancers, and the fluidity, I don't know, I hope you can see that in these, but they have these long sleeves. Incidentally, you're never supposed to show your hands in China. That's why these robes are so long, because hands were not considered to be an attractive thing. You don't see any hands in these. These, these robes come all the way down on both of these sets of figures, totally incorporating uh, their, their hand. Interestingly, on the one on the right, uh, if you'll notice the shoes, she has these, the tips of her shoes are these cloud forms. Um, quite unusual. And again, we wouldn't know that fashion, except that it's in these, uh, on these figures. Um, and the headdresses on the ones on this side, I think are, I don't have much hair, so I'm always impressed with hairdressing. And uh, these are, have, these have extraordinary headdresses that uh, sort of like, um, Mr. G, or I don't know, one of those TV characters had. Um, but they're really quite wonderful. But again, these would be in a tomb to keep you in the afterlife. These are court ladies from the Tang Dynasty. Again, we're now moving midway through Chinese uh, uh, dynastic development. Now we're going into the uh, Song Dynasty. Many people, Song incidentally can be written S-O-N-G, this is all called English, it's not the way the Chinese refer to it, or Song, S-U-N-G, I, I use Song, not sure I know why, but I just do. Um, but it's the same dynasty, it ran from uh, 960 to 1270, uh, 1279. Many people consider the Song dynasty to be the high point of Chinese porcelain develop, development. And you'll, a couple of these objects, you'll, I think you'll see why. The one on this side, again, is a tortoiseshell glaze. Now, these are tea bowls. These are small, I'm guessing about, uh, about uh, four and a half, five inches across diameter. And that is a tortoiseshell glaze, which is an exceptionally difficult glaze to get. These are very rare, very few of these objects uh, exist. I will tell you there's another one, a beautiful example. I happen to think mine is a little better, but that's, that's just my feeling. At the MFA from the Charles Hoyt collection, they have one of these beautiful um, tortoiseshell glaze. Um, this is also my wife's favorite, one of my wife's favorite pieces in the collection. The one on the other side is a hare's fur. The hair may have reference to a rabbit. And on the interior, you see these very fine little white hairs. Technically, again, very difficult to, to uh, get this glaze. Um, these, took, these were extraordinary craftsmen, all under the control of the imperial 
um, family. The porcelain was, an, was a business and it was completely controlled by the imperial decrees. You couldn't just start a, a porcelain factory and make your own design, not at all. Um, and in the Song Dynasty, we have some of the finest that have ever, some of the finest objects that have ever come out of China. Uh, this is also from the Song Dynasty, and at first glance you may think, and some people have looked at this in amazement and think this would be an ideal base for a lamp. Um, this is one of the most important pieces in my collection. Uh, it, had, it came from a magnificent, came from a Mrs. Mellon's collection. It was then in the um, uh, Virginia Fine Arts Museum until they deacquisition, and I was fortunate enough to acquire it for my collection. It's one of the single finest pieces of, of, a, of a Song Dynasty porcelain. And the reason for that is the monochrome, the whiteness, the form, it's just perfect. This is the absolute form of perfection in the Song period. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, a friend, a great friend of, I think, many people in this room, an avid collector who has an extraordinary collection. Um, Max Berry came over to my house and looked at the collection, and he was, if, I, I believe it's accurate to say, he was awestruck with this piece. And there are a lot of pieces that get your, uh, catch your attention, but a Song Dynasty person would look at this and really be impressed. It's a magnificent example. Now, the Song Dynasty uh, was overthrown by the Mongols. Uh, everyone is familiar with, uh, with Genghis Khan. His grandson, Kublai Khan, was the first, not the last, but he was the first uh, foreigner to establish control over China with the Yuan Dynasty. He threw out or finally overthrew both the North Song the Song then retreated to the south part of China, and then he finally defeated the uh, South Song and then established the Yuan Dynasty. Not a terribly long dynasty, as you can see, uh, what, 90, 89 years. Um, very important dynasty, however. Uh, he, not being Chinese, um, he, uh, they released all of the controls over the uh, porcelain. Um, uh, you didn't have to have approval. Um, they were allowed much wider latitude in the designs. And you see for the first time sort of very interesting, some say modern designs. The object on the right has a direct, direct the, the, the turquoise one, depending on my direction here. That is a spirit uh, vase, uh, has uh, three small uh, little uh, uh, openings at the top and one central opening one. When Marco Polo, came to China. It was during this time. Uh, and he traveled to China, not, not by Virgin Air or American Airlines or something, but he came the long way, right through the Silk Road, all the way through Persia. And when he was received into the court of the emperor, Kublai Khan, he told the, the emperor that they had in Persia, they had this magnificent turquoise glaze, which the Chinese did not have. And the emperor then sent out emissaries, and make a long story short, they obtained the formula, the, the ability to make turquoise glaze. What's terribly important about this piece that you see in front of you is that this is considered to be one of the very first examples of this glaze, which is still used to this day. But this is one of the very first examples from the Yuan dynasty when they obtained the glaze, the turquoise glaze um, from the Persians. Incidentally, the Persians wanted, so did everybody else, wanted the, the uh, information on how to uh, do white glazes. They didn't get it. And when Kublai Khan took back a piece, he was in China for 28 years, when he took back a piece of white, white uh, porcelain back to the West, it is for that reason to this day when you walk into any store and you want to go buy a piece of China and you ask for the China department, it's because of that last piece I just showed you, because of this, because of this white porcelain. That's the reason why to this day when you go into Tiffany's or any department store and say, where's the China department? Because white porcelain was referred to as China and still is to this day.
that any porcelain is made, or any china is china, but that's where it came from. Uh, this is, a, again, from the Yuan Dynasty, and again, you can see the fluidity, the really wild colors. This is a pillow. This is what you put your head down, ladies, every night on. Now, this is a large pillow. This is about 16 inches wide, and it has this wonderful flying phoenix in the clouds uh, on it. Absolutely extraordinary. You'd never have seen this in the Song Dynasty or later on when we get into the Ming. Uh, but this is a, a wonderful example of the, uh, this uh, new vitality that they had in the Song, excuse me, in the Yuan uh, Dynasty period. Again, somewhat short-lived, but, but they did have it then. The Yuan Dynasty was overthrown by, of course, one of the most famous dynasties of all, the Ming. And the Ming lasted not a terribly long period of time, but uh, this is an exceptional example. This is a kendi. Now, a kendi is merely a pouring vessel. This is a ritual pouring vessel. The, uh, the water or wine or whatever, the fluid, goes in uh, through that top. And then to the left, there's a little pouring spout. And that's how it is. The, the water is poured. This is a large object, about 18 inches. Um, and this is not a boat which uh, I, anybody, w I would think so if I didn't know better, uh, and I didn't know better. Um, uh, this is from uh, the Zhuangdi Emperor, a very important piece. This piece was made for the Persian market. That is not a boat. That is the crescent shape of a moon, which is extraordinarily important to any Arabic, any uh, Arabic country. Uh, these were exported to Persia. And incidentally, the, the blue one that you see up there, the blue one that you see up there is actually another one that has been damaged. Um, and that is in the National Museum of Indonesia in Jakarta. Uh, the reason it's been damaged, if you look at the pouring spout, that is silver plus the two top pieces. Uh, they also have silver. That's a way to disguise the fact that it has been chipped or broken off. Um, also, it is missing one leg, which they made no attempt to repair. Uh, but that is a kendi, a very unusual piece, and, uh, and as I said, is peculiar only to the, this particular design of kendi is peculiar to really the Persian market. Now we move into sort of the traditional Ming ware, uh, the large plate, and when I say large, it's about 19 inches wide, the blue and white one there. This was made for, uh, this was export made. This was made for, it's called a Karak ware, and it was made for the, uh, for the Netherlands. It was taken back in one of the Dutch ships. Karak is a word, it's a, uh, it's a Chinese adaptation for the Dutch word cargo ship in Dutch, which they could not pronounce. Neither can I, now that I think of it. Uh, so they called it Karak, and to this day, it's referred to as Karakware. Uh, we know exactly when this piece was made. It's obviously a Ming Dynasty piece, but we know exactly what emperor it was made because a piece identical to this appears in a Vermeer painting. And as all Westerners are famous to do, unlike Chinese artists, they sign their work and they date it. So we know that this is not just from the Ming Empire. We know it is from Emperor Wan Li, the second great emperor of the Ming Dynasty. He was not the second emperor, but he was one of the great emperors. The, the green and red uh, jarlet on the other side um, of the slide is much smaller. The, the blue plate is, is this large. It's a charger. The, uh, the other one, unfortunately, in this you don't get the perspective, but is, is only maybe four inches tall. But it's in of exceptional uh, colors, and, um, and it is really beautiful. But again, it's very organized. It's how it's done, the formality of it. Again, now the Ming took over from the Yuan, and they reinserted the controls over porcelain manufacture, even porcelain man manufacture that was not imperial wear. Neither of these pieces would have gone to the Forbidden City, would have gone. They would never have been considered to be important enough. These were actually considered to be inferior. These were sent to the heathens out there. Um, Swato, incidentally, refers to the port of exit in, in China. 
um, and they, uh, that's where that uh, attribution of that name comes from. Uh, this is a hip roof tile, one of two objects that we know. Roof tiles are very common uh, to this day in China. Most of the buildings have, uh, have roof tiles. They incidentally ward away bad things. You have these, these, uh, these uh, um, things, uh, these objects on the roof up there, and they will keep thunderstorms or fires from something away. What's very unusual about this, apart from its size, it's about this big. I wanted to bring it today, but I couldn't talk Beverly into carrying it. Um, it's about this large. But we, what's very unusual about this particular roof tile, and one other that I have, is we know exactly where it came from. There are many, many roof tiles, but they are taken off buildings. Nobody sort of knows what buildings. This was taken from the Summer Imperial Palace in 1860. That was taken in 1860. It was made a good deal earlier, uh, probably in the early 17th century or even earlier because it's Ming. Uh, it was removed from the Imperial Summer Palace at the end of the Second Opium War by the Anglo-French plus Americans, Dutch, um, Danes. We, uh, we invaded as retribution for the Second Opium War in 1860. We looted the entire palace and then we burned it down. Um, not great family values, but that's what happened. Um, uh, the, the, we looted everything from the palace, everything that could be taken. What we couldn't take, we burned. Um, the, uh, the empress who had fled, the empress's dog, was sent to Queen Victoria. She had that dog, a Pekingese, lovely little Pekingese, I understand, until that dog died. She renamed it Looty. And it was with her at Balmoral until uh, the dog died some years later. But this is a, an impressive uh, a roof tile. A, uh, the hip meaning it was the joining of the two of a corner. And this is a lovely piece. Incidentally, while the building was destroyed, burnt to the ground, um, all of the objects from the Summer Imperial Palace, which was in Beijing, but it was the Summer Imperial Palace, are extraordinarily well documented. Everything, the, the plans for every object. So we know exactly what corner, apart from the fact that it was taken by an English major who was later um, promoted to a general, and then I acquired it from his uh, son's, his grandson's estate about 20 years ago. This is one of two uh, objects from the Imperial Summer Palace. I'm not going to talk about it quite yet, but the other object from the interior of the palace is the duck that you see in front of you. Now, I talked a moment ago about Karak ware and Swato ware, which were export pieces in the Ming Dynasty. This is not an export piece. This is a Blanc de Chine piece. This is a copy. It is really a Ming Dynasty piece, but this, this, uh, this form is called a Gu, G-U, and it is a copy or the goo form is a bronze piece that was made, made way back, if you remember, several centuries before, several millennium before, in the Zhou or Shang dynasty. They had these bronze objects in this shape. This is a Ming interpretation. This is a, this is a major and quite important piece, a 17th century piece. It is made right during the transition period between the Ming and the Qing dynasty. This is a very important piece. This is an imperial piece. This would have been in the imperial palace or, or uh, would have been solely used for a member of the royal family. It's a piece of reverence for, for reverence. Uh, it is not an object to be used for anything except to be admired. Very formal piece as well. Now we move into the last dynasty. Uh, the Qing Dynasty ran from 1644 to 1911, with Puyi, last emperor, being uh, abdicating in, in 1911. Uh, this is a, a, a really quite an extraordinary and detailed plate. It's from a, the Yanglong uh, emperor, um, and the reference to the Dukali it means. Uh, Make sure I get that right. It means contrasting colors. This was a technically very difficult uh, glaze and design to accomplish. It required multiple firings, five or six firings for this one plate. This, too, is an imperial piece. This is not made for export. Uh, at the same time that this piece was made, 
you'll see a lot of Chinese export, and they have some beautiful Chinese exports throughout this museum that we're in. I have very few object, uh, Chinese export uh, in the sense of uh, that, that era in my collection. But this is what was made at the same time as many of the, uh, of the 18th century Chinese export, but this is an imperial plate uh, from that period and is really quite lovely. The colors, you, they don't quite translate too well. Now, uh, these are also Qing Dynasty robes. The one on this side is an informal robe. This is a jifu. And this is what you would have to wear at court. A man or a woman would have to wear this at court. Court being, you know, in the presence of the emperor or for any official function. That is an informal robe. What I am wearing is a formal robe called a kofu. These are exceptionally rare for an odd reason. You would only wear these if you were invited to one of four principal affairs at the Forbidden City. Uh, they were these, uh, you know, very important functions, the beginning of the new year, the April or the, the harvest period. These were very formal. And if there were a wedding, a, a, an imperial wedding, you would wear a kofu. Very few people, in relation to the population, were, were, ever would have a kofu. Um, but that's the first reason why these are rare. The second reason is a tradition in China. You were buried, they're not cremated in China even to this day, uh, you were buried. And you are always buried and have always been buried in China in your most important winter robe. This is a winter kofu. You would only have one. The only person who might have more of them would be, well, obviously, the emperor had probably dozens. Um, maybe his brothers, consorts, whatever, would also have multiple ones. Um, this is not probably the em one of the emperor's robes, although the color is very interesting. Only the emperor could wear uh, yellow. This is the Qinlong emperor wearing a kofu, what I'm wearing right here. Uh, exactly the same outfit. Uh, the red shoes are not part of the outfit. Um, but that is the outfit, the chain around the, my neck, is a, is a mandarin chain. You had to be invited to wear this by the emperor. Only certain people could wear this. And once you were given that permission to wear that, you always had one. These chains are made in a number of different um, um, uh, materials. The one I'm wearing today is carved zitan wood, which is an a wood reserved only for the imperial family, zitan wood. If I'm not mistaken, it's purple sandalwood, which I believe is or is close to extinct. Um, it is made of 108 uh, smaller beads and four registers of 27 each, separated by large jade beads, which are referred to as Buddha beads. And then the strap hanging down the center of my back is actually just a weight, a counterweight to weigh the thing. And these are, these are believed to have come from uh, Tibet originally as prayer beads. Uh, there are three counting, small counting stripes, uh, counting beads or stripes are referred to. This one, these are made actually of amber, these beads. Three registers of those, uh, one on the right and the two on the left always. And you'll see this occasionally when people wear these. Uh, the, the, the two beads, the two, I, get, I love this kind of stuff. But the two small counting rows of beads would always be worn over your heart. If you ever see it the other way around, it's not proper. I don't suppose anybody cares, but anyway. Um, only the emperor could wear a mandarin chain made of pearls. Uh, the hat that I'm wearing is made as covered in, this is a winter hat as opposed to a summer hat. Uh, you, and when the emperor decided that it was time to change from winter to summer, you never wore the one that he changed until, this, until he decided it was time to change back. Um, this one is made or has, is covered in fur, uh, otter fur. It has a uh, uh, silk floss and it has a knob, which is of course clearly not the emperor's. This is a, sink, excuse me, a sixth rank uh, knob, uh, a civilian official. Um, and uh, 
but that's where this, this outfit uh, differs from this. This is a uh, less formal, and this is the normal robe that you would normally see. You'll see there's an, this is a summer robe, the jifu that's up there as opposed to a winter one. The winter ones would be made uh, probably of silk, because this one is, this is made of gauze, woven gauze, it's called tasi. Um Now the one on the left, for me, I guess you're right, that is a, um, a woman's quasi-official vest, an exceptionally beautiful one. And you'll notice right in the middle of it, uh, right in the middle of her chest, is a rank badge. And women, of course, were never allowed rank, which is odd because the empress, the dowager empress who ruled China, was a woman. However, uh, however a woman could wear and did wear her husband's rank. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a rank, if I'm not mistaken. Where's mine here? Um, this is a uh, phoenix. Uh, so this is a uh, fourth rank. The bird on that is a phoenix, a golden phoenix. So that's a fourth rank civilian, civil, uh, which is a very high rank. But this is her, this is the wife of the husband who held that rank. Uh, these are quite unusual, and they're really quite spectacular. Um, these vests, very, you know, they just, they, they're rare um, largely because people didn't, these were very expensive, these were costly to have made, they take, uh, these robes took two years to the embroidery. Incidentally, which I found fascinating, these were not embroidered in this fashion. And uh, since I know very little about, about the process of making dresses, it came as a complete surprise to me. They are embroidered in enormous sheets and patterns. Then once finished, then they are taken to get taken apart and then stitched into the robe. Uh, Mrs. Hellman showed me a robe that she had from her grandmother or from a family member. Of her. That was done the same way. And to this day, you will occasionally see a robe after the Qing Dynasty fell in 1911. They were selling these on the street by the pound. Uh, they had looted the palaces. They were just getting rid of everything. There were no need for these things anymore during the Republic period. But you, you, you come across, you occasionally will come across at auctions, you know, a, an imperial robe that has not actually been assembled. Last object on the robe, my wife is wearing a, a robe, a beautiful winter robe. It is, oh, the color of the robe determines who could wear it. This robe could be worn by the emperor or by a secondary uh, the emperor's brother. We cannot really tell what the color is. I don't want to turn it over because it'll hit the mic, but because this one is so dirty over the years, it's gotten, has not been well cared for. And I'm going to hopefully do something about that. But if this color is determined to be this bright yellow, then that would be just for the emperor. If it's more of a golden yellow, which probably I couldn't tell, but a real expert could tell, then it would be then for a first rank blood blood brother of the prince, an imperial prince. Beverly's robe that she's wearing is brown, the silk brown. Why don't you stand up so we can see it? Um, that, is, that was made for a duke. Only a duke could wear a brown silk robe. The tragedy about this robe is, and this is a term that is used in textiles, that robe has been molested. It has been cut down from the way this is. So that robe would be an extraordinary object in relatively good shape, except that it has been made into a cocktail dress. I mean, it's lovely, and I don't mean there's anything wrong with that, but it is, from a collector's standpoint, it is not, this is what it should look like. As dirty as this one is, am I not moving fast enough? This is a winter hat, like what I'm wearing. Uh, this one has the um, has a, uh, a peacock feather on it, and incidentally, a, a, a little a plume holder that is made of carved jade. The emperor, if you did something very good for the emperor, he would allow you the honor of wearing a peacock feather. So you will you see very few of these, uh, but if you had the honor, uh, you would always wear it. Uh, these are shoes from the Qing Dynasty. The one on the the little one, the single one up there, is from that terrible tradition of bound feet. These are both grown women's shoes. Uh, the one on the little lotus or bound foot shoe is about three and a half inches long. 
this binding of feet, terrible thing. Um, but that's how a grown woman's shoe foot would fit into that shoe. The one, uh, the the platform were worn by the man shoes. The Han dynasty, the Han women. Only, again, only very few of them did, very high class, or people who wanted to attain that high class would bind their feet. Man shoes, they were foreigners, they did not bind their feet. And they wore, however, these platform heels, which I would think, except for Lady Gaga, would be sort of difficult to wear. Um, these objects here, again, from the uh, Qing Dynasty, these are all objects that you would have on a scholar's desk. Now, a scholar is, would be a lawyer, a professional person wouldn't necessarily be someone just sitting around and thinking great thoughts. This uh, scholar referred to, referred to somebody who was a professional person. The, uh, the brush stand with all those wonderful calligraphy brushes, these were very common. It's a 19th century, beautiful uh, entwined carved wood, um, uh, dra carved dragon uh, uh, brush stand. They are incredibly rare now. They were, they were they made, they made many of them, I don't know how many. But during the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, 1960s, if you had one of these in your house, if your grandfather had one of these, your father had one of these, and if the, the Red Guards found it, off with your head. So these were all destroyed. These now are very rare. Not because they were, there weren't many made, quite the contrary. They, they were destroyed in order to, so that, so that you were not destroyed. Uh, the brush pot is another, uh, 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 incidentally, the brush pot is about 10 inches wide, diameter-wise. It's a beautifully decorated one with a uh, Quinlan on the top uh, decoration, and that's also you would put brushes in it. So the bottom is an ink stone. That's how you made ink. You ground this. It was made from soot. You ground it and added a little water to it. Uh, one of the last pieces is also from the, uh, the object right in front of you here, this duck. This was from, it's a Qing Dynasty piece. This was one of the two objects I'm showing today that came from the Summer Palace when it was looted in uh, 1860. This was an interior piece. This was taken by the Danish ambassador back to Copenhagen and was in his family for a couple of generations and was um, then put up for auction and I was able to acquire it. Again, because of the detailed records that they have of what was in the Summer Palace, we know exactly what room it was in. It was incidentally uh, about 15 to 20 feet off the ground, and where it's displayed in our house, we now um, have it way off the ground, not sort of eye level where you have it. That thing hanging out of his beak is a lotus blossom, very important to the Chinese. And then one of the last objects I want to uh, discuss today, I, before uh, my withering uh, 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 explanation from my wife of what I had to wear today, I was going to wear this metal medallion that you see up here, which is a Chinese medallion, and it's, it's here. Uh, this is, um, was owned by a uh, man I never met who died 20 years ago today. And uh, he had an extraordinary um, uh, a snuff bottle collection, which I knew all about and had all the records of and the catalogs on and the books and some of his writings about this. It wasn't until a number of years later that I found out that this man is my wife's father. I slow down when I say that because I get confused sometimes. But uh, he has been a real influence, although I did never, I, although I never met Mr. Mack, has been a real influence. The snuff bottle that you see up there was from his collection and was a tremendous, um, it's one of the very few snuff bottles I have in my collection because I have not specialized in one area. He had an extraordinary collection and uh, was a very passionate and enthusiastic uh, collector. The last item I'm going to discuss, am I okay? One last. This, uh, when I got married, this my collection, which has been 40 years in the making, uh, has been generally mine, um, in that I was the one who made the decisions with a lot of advice and, and things. But uh, when I uh, got married a little, a little less than a year ago, it became our collection. This is the first object that uh, is our from our collection. Beverly and I acquired this. 
uh, extraordinarily by luck. Uh, this is from an extraordinarily important collection um, that was dispersed at the death of the woman who had it. Um, and it is an Indian piece. It's a Gupta period. It is almost life size. You don't get that feel from up there. The auction house told us that it weighed 500 pounds when we acquired it. When it was delivered up here, uh, Federal Express <laughs> informs me that it weighs not 500 pounds, but 1,200 pounds. The plinths had to be remade. I called the auction company up and I said, it weighs two and a half times what you said. Well, we only estimate. I said, well, Federal Express doesn't estimate the charges. <laughs> Didn't do any good. But it's an extraordinary piece. And uh, we were, we, I have been, and we continue to be very lucky on some of our acquisitions. This is a piece that should be in a major uh, museum, like the, the Fine Arts Museum in the Metropolitan. This is a magnificent piece. Um, it is fifth century Gupta period. It is the Buddha of Sarnoff. This is, represents the first time he gave a lecture to his six disciples, which are down there. The damage that you see to this object um, is probably as a result of Hindu um, uh, desecrations. They, the way they would uh, desecrate a Buddhist statue would be to take the hands off, the faces off, uh, heads. Although the head on this may have been taken off as an archaeological find and may very well be in some museum around the world. Um, but uh, that's why you see the damage that there has been uh, to that. I want to thank you for being so patient and, um, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share my collection uh, with you and would welcome if you'd like, uh, if there are any questions or if I can be of any help, I want to thank Marjan. Ladies and gentlemen, life. please let's give a very warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. David, it's been extraordinary following through these one-of-a-kind artifacts, your journey of collecting. And I wondered, first, we're going to open it up to questions to the audience. But while we're looking for our first question, how do you know what your next piece might be? Do you have a list of things that you would like to own, or how does that work? Well, there are, oddly enough, uh, I, do have, well, I do have a, a bucket list. I call it my want list. I'm not that clever to come up with the bucket list, but, but I do. The, the one benefit of having a broad collection like I have is that I'm able to take advantage. Certain things come, uh, come up at auctions, generally speaking, or dealers. Uh, and depending on whether it's out of favor at the moment, you can sometimes obtain something that you couldn't otherwise obtain. This is a good example. This piece, no one wanted the day of the auction. Now, the day of the auction happened to be the day before or after Christmas. Uh, it was a Nobody should schedule an auction on the day after Christmas. I mean, we're not eating plum pie. We're looking at objects. Uh, uh, but because of that, I've been able to get things um, uh, because my collection is so broad. Um, uh, uh, but I do have a list, thank you for asking. Not, not as broad as it used to be. But. I would love to see that list. Questions <laughs> from the audience. Yes, sir, right here. Thank you very much. Um, question one, early on you were showing tomb pieces from ter of terracotta. Were they cast or carved? These are generally molded, um, but the faces on the, 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 um, the terracotta warriors from Shishawandi, those are all, um, uh, uh, those were all individually molded and then crafted. But, the, but the, 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 most of the figures that I've shown here today were made in a, were, were from a mold. Uh, the exceptions, uh, there are some ex exceptions, but generally speaking, they are molded. Second question, in the time that you've been, been collecting, now with the wealth that is in China, have you seen prices escalate dramatically? Dramatically. Uh, two, uh, two things I would make a comment. I hope there's not a lot of Chinese people in here. Chinese have no tradition of collecting. The, uh, one of the oldest, I believe the oldest museum in China is the Shanghai Museum. It's 40 years old. 
not like the British Museum. They have no tradition of collecting. Well, now they got all the money in the world, including all of ours. And uh, they are buying everything. They have terrible taste. <laughs> now, that's what always happens when somebody starts collecting something. And they are getting more and more refined. They bought, they, in a couple of years ago, they would buy anything. And there are stories about the things that they would buy and didn't pay for or you know, uh, bought for outrageous sums. I mean, a, a Qing dynasty. I mean, a, a Qing dynasty vase. Again, we're talking about 18th century. Went for 60 million dollars in London. I mean, it wasn't. It was worth a couple hundred thousand dollars. And I don't mean to say it like that, but I mean that's a lot of money. But I mean, it was absurd. These prices. Well, they become as every collector does. Um, you become more educated. Uh, there's now a huge. Uh, there's a, such a huge, such a huge wealth of. Uh, in China now that they're establishing these private museums because there really aren't municipal museums, large municipal national museums. They have established one in Peking. The greatest collection of Chinese art in China, it's not in China, it's in Taiwan. It was everything that Chiang Kai-shek looted, a lot of that looting going on over there, it looted when he, you know, and when he uh, moved down to Taiwan, and the National Palace in Taiwan has the, by far the greatest imperial collection, because he brought, he, he took all those pieces. Great but questions. that will change. But they're paying, I couldn't afford to, to replace any of the things that I have because of the Chinese. Yes, that has crossed my mind. And we have another question. David, thank you. Do I understand that some of your pieces have been in other museums or institutions? Uh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of them have. When I would acquire a piece, um, these aren't good examples of it, but some of them up here. When I would acquire a piece, uh, the, the two big auction houses where I've acquired a number of pieces from, I would inform them that if they had an inquiry from an institution, uh, that they would, they could give them my name. They, I'd ask them not to give them my name if it was just a dealer, or, uh, you know. Uh, and I would, I would get questions or I would get requests to loan objects. And most of the collection um, was loaned and has been documented. Uh, it's been in very various exhibitions. Actually, three years ago, when I decided to move up here, I moved up here permanently five years ago. It was at that point that I made the decision to put the whole, bring everything back. And uh, I asked all the museums and institutions around the world that I had lent various pieces, some one piece, some several pieces. The entire collection of bound shoes was in Copenhagen for four years and used to get lines of people to come see it. Which is odd, but anyway. Um, and, uh, uh, but I ask, as the exhibits, you know, came to an end, I would like to have the objects back. So they, this is actually the first time they've all been here. I'm sure some of us would love to know a couple of the names of the institutions and museums that um, housed your collection. I can't think of one major museum, well, there are actually there are a lot, but I mean, mo many of them in, uh, I mean, I, I lent the, uh, the scholar's desk uh, items to, believe it or not, the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. They have one of the most extraordinary collections of Chinese art, and they wanted that. That's not terribly important in my view, and I was honored to do it. Um, the, uh, one of my horses was at LACMA, it was at the Los Angeles County Art Museum, and they put it in, they, had, they photographed it in front of a wonderful Matisse, and when I wrote them and said, yeah, I'd like to have it back, you know, whenever it's out, off the exhibition, I'm saying, God, maybe they'll send the Matisse. <laughs> they didn't. Um, but, but they have been all over. I have an elephant from the Sackler Museum in Smithsonian. Um, the, the wonderful um, uh, imperial goo form vase, that was with uh, um, uh, Mrs., Mrs. Mellon Bruce, um, and then it was with the Virginia Art Museum, um, and I acquired it from them. Most of my pieces have been, and I did this in the beginning because I wasn't sure what was real and what wasn't real. It has served me quite by accident very well because I would, rather than buy several pieces, I would buy one piece that had a great provenance, that came from a great collection. Because, quite frankly, I didn't know enough then. And I thought, well, if this came from the C.T. Lou collection, this was good. 
Well, that has served me very well because uh, provenance is extremely important now. You need to know, you know, they fake everything. That should come as no surprise. Um, and uh, all of these pieces uh, have relatively very thorough, meticulous records. I have, incidentally, been fooled. I bought a magnificent uh, Song Dynasty vase, and I still have it um, uh, because it turned out it was fake. And I keep it. And I paid a lot of money for it, but I keep it because I want to remind myself you know, some things are too good to be true. Um, uh, so thank you. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to close the questions, but David will be here and please take a moment again. Let's thank him and take a moment to oh, come up close you. and see his right Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.